welcome to the deep dive. Today we're tackling something really critical, keeping those complex industrial systems running safely, you know, catching problems before they become disasters. Absolutely. Anomaly detection is key. And we're looking beyond the, uh, the standard machine learning playbook today. We are. We're diving into a newer technique, maybe a bit less known, but pretty powerful. Physics-informed neural networks. PINNs for short. PINs. Oh, okay. And we've got some practitioner-focused material to guide us. Exactly. It's a really good guide, actually. Our aim here is to give you the essentials pretty quickly, why you might even consider PINs, what they actually do differently, how people are using them out there, and maybe most importantly. When do they actually make sense for your problem? Precisely. We want this to be a practical shortcut, you know, helping you figure out if PINs could be a fit without getting totally bogged down in uh, super technical details. Sounds good. So let's start with the why. Why look beyond traditional ML? What are the sort of limitations when we're talking about these complex industrial systems? Well, standard ML, it definitely has its place, don't get me wrong. But for these really complex physical systems, it bumps up against some real walls. Like what, specifically? Okay, so one big one is the whole black box issue. Your typical ML model gets really good at spotting statistical patterns in the data you feed it. Right. Correlation, not necessarily causation. Exactly. But it doesn't inherently understand the physics of the system. So it might flag something that's statistically weird, but perfectly fine physically. Or worse, it could miss an anomaly that's physically impossible because it looks statistically normal within the limited data it's seen. Ah, okay. So it could give a thumbs up to a situation that just couldn't happen in reality. Precisely. It lacks that physical sanity check. Another huge hurdle is data or rather the lack of it. The classic data hunger problem. Yes, but amplified here. Good ML models usually need lots of data, especially labeled data showing both normal and abnormal states. But think about it, in a well-run industrial plant, major failures are, hopefully, rare. You don't want lots of anomaly data. You really don't. So getting enough labeled examples of failures is tough. And even getting comprehensive normal data covering every possible operating condition, different seasons, different loads, that's a challenge too. And if you train it only on, say, summer data? It might freak out when winter comes along, yeah. It sees normal winter behavior as an anomaly because it's outside its training experience, which means constant retraining, more data gathering. It's a cycle. Right. It can only learn from what it's seen. And what about things we can't even measure easily? That's another key point. Traditional ML is fundamentally limited by the sensors you have installed. But sometimes the critical clues about system health are hidden in variables that aren't directly measured, maybe temperature inside a reaction vessel or stress on a hidden component. Because it's too expensive or impractical to put a sensor there. Exactly. If the anomaly lives in that unmeasured space, your standard ML model is likely blind to it. Okay. And even if it does catch something. Often it just gives you an anomaly score, like something's wrong, score 0.9, but it doesn't tell you why. Is it a sensor drift? Is a valve stuck? Is the underlying process changing? That lack of insight makes troubleshooting the root cause analysis incredibly difficult. Okay, so summing up the why. Traditional ML often struggles with the physics, needs tons of data we might not have, can't see unmeasured variables, and doesn't explain why something's wrong. That's a pretty good summary, yeah. It just lacks that deep physical intuition. Which brings us nicely to pin ends. What's the core idea? What makes them different? Well, this is where it gets really interesting. Pinons try to bridge that gap by uh, directly baking the physics into the neural network itself. Baking the physics in? How does that work? Okay, so fundamentally, they are still neural networks. They take inputs like time and location, and they try to predict system states like temperature or pressure. They learn from data, just like other NNs. But there's a twist. A crucial twist. During training, they aren't just trying to match the sensor data you provide. They're also penalized if their predictions violate the known physical laws governing the system. So you feed them the equations, like conservation of energy or fluid dynamics equations. Exactly. You define these governing equations maybe as partial differential equations, or PDEs. The PIN then checks its own predictions against these equations at many points in space and time if the predictions don't satisfy the physics. It gets a slap on the wrist, metaphorically speaking. Metaphorically, yes. It gets a higher physics loss. The network then adjusts itself not only to fit the data better, but also to adhere more closely to the physical laws. It's like it's learning from two teachers, the data and the physics textbook. And how does it check those equations? That sounds computationally heavy. It uses a technique called automatic differentiation. 
It's a, a clever way built into modern machine learning frameworks that lets the network easily calculate how its outputs change and whether they fit the derivatives in those physical equations without us having to do all the calculus manually. Okay, that's clever. So, learning from data and physical laws. What are the concrete advantages of this for anomaly detection then? Well, it leads directly to several benefits. First, you get better physical consistency. Because the model knows the physics, it's much less likely to accept a physically impossible state as normal. Fewer false negatives, potentially. Right, it has that sanity check built in. Second, they can be less dependent on huge amounts of labeled data. The physics itself provides a strong learning signal, a form of regularization, you could say. It's like getting extra information for free, helping the model learn even when measurement data is sparse. Physics acts like like new data. Interesting. So it can learn the underlying principles, not just surface patterns. Does that help with the extrapolation problem too? Yes, significantly. Because it understands the governing physical relationships, it can often generalize better to new operating conditions it hasn't explicitly seen in the training data, reducing the need for constant retraining. The physics provides a more robust foundation. And the unmeasured variables issue. PNNs can help there too. Because they solve for the physical fields across the system, they can often infer the values of quantities you aren't measuring directly. It's sometimes called virtual sensing. This gives you a much more complete picture of the system's state. Wow, okay. Virtual sensors, that's powerful. And finally, remember the root cause analysis problem. PANNs offer much more insight. When an anomaly occurs, you can often see which physical laws are being violated by the system's behavior according to the PIN. This points you towards the potential cause. Is it a heat transfer issue, a fluid flow problem? It offers clues about causality, not just correlation. Okay, that's a compelling list of advantages. Right. Physical consistency, less data needed, better extrapolation, virtual sensing, and richer diagnostics. So how are people actually putting these into practice? What do the implementations look like? There seem to be three main patterns emerging. The first one is often called the digital twin approach. A digital twin, okay, like a virtual replica. Exactly. You train a PNN to be a highly accurate, physics-consistent model of your system operating normally. Then, in real time, you feed it the actual sensor readings. The PNN predicts what the system should be doing based on those inputs and the physics. And you compare its prediction to what your other sensors are actually measuring. Precisely. If the real measurements start to diverge significantly from the PAN's physics-aware predictions, if the residuals, the differences, get too large, you flag an anomaly. Got it. Any examples of that working? Yeah, there's a good one from additive manufacturing, specifically selective laser melting. Researchers used a PNN to predict the complex temperature fields during the printing process. It was able to detect subtle thermal anomalies, deviations from the expected physics-based temperature patterns that were precursors to print defects. Things a purely data-driven model might have dismissed as noise. Because the PNN knew what the temperature should have been doing physically. Okay, that makes sense. What's the second pattern? The second is framed as an inverse problem. This is a bit different. Instead of just detecting a deviation, you're trying to infer underlying physical parameters of the system that might have changed when an anomaly occurs. So you're asking the PNN to figure out what changed in the physics? Kind of, yeah. You treat certain physical properties, maybe material stiffness or thermal conductivity or friction coefficients as unknown variables that the PNN has to learn alongside its usual network weights. It tries to find parameter values that best explain the sensor data while still satisfying the governing physics. An anomaly is detected if these inferred parameters shift away from their expected normal values. Hmm. Interesting. Can you give an example? Sure. Think about non-destructive testing, like looking for cracks in metal plates using sound waves. Researchers used a PNN where the local wave speed in the material was an unknown field the PNN had to infer. By analyzing how waves pass through the plate, measured by sensors, the PINN could map out variations in wave speed. A significant local change in inferred wave speed would indicate a hitting defect, like a crack, because the crack changes how the waves travel physically. And importantly, they could do this without any prior data from already cracked plates. The PNN could even give hints about the defect's size and shape based on the inferred wave speed map. Wow, so it's detecting the anomaly by actually characterizing the change in the system's physical properties. Very cool. And the third pattern. The third is more of a hybrid model approach. This basically involves blending PNNs with more traditional ML techniques. How so? Well, you could embed physics into the architecture of a standard model, like creating a physics-informed autoencoder. 
the physics acts as an extra constraint during the encoding and decoding, potentially leading to better data representations that highlight anomalies violating physical laws. So enhancing existing methods with physics. Right. Or you could use them sequentially. Maybe a PAN generates high-fidelity physics-based predictions or residuals, and then a separate, more standard ML anomaly detection algorithm analyzes those outputs to find subtle deviations. Okay. Any examples there? There's work in power grid cybersecurity using physics-informed autoencoders. The goal was to detect stealthy cyber attacks that manipulate sensor readings in a way that looks normal statistically but actually violates fundamental electrical laws like Kirchhoff's laws. By adding penalties for violating those laws into the autoencoder's training, they could better spot these attacks that a purely data-driven method might miss. Okay, three distinct approaches. The digital twin monitor, the inverse problem investigator, and the hybrid enhancer. Seems quite versatile, but it sounds that. complex too. Are PANs the perfect solution? What are the catches, the gotchas? Oh, definitely not a silver bullet. There are absolutely challenges. One of the biggest is probably implementation complexity. Mm -hmm. Compared to using off-the-shelf traditional ML libraries, building and training a PAN requires more effort. You need to know the physics, right? Yeah. And how to code it up. Exactly. You need that domain expertise to formulate the governing equations correctly. And then you need the skills to implement them as loss terms, tune the network, and so on. There aren't as many prepackaged, easy to use PINN libraries specifically for industrial anomaly detection just yet. Makes sense. What else? Training them can also be computationally expensive. Calculating those physics residuals at many, many points across the system domain adds significant computational overhead compared to standard supervised learning. It takes more time, more processing power. Okay, so potentially slower yeah. and needs more grunts. Yeah. And the training process itself can be tricky. You're often balancing multiple objectives, fitting the data, satisfying different physical laws, getting that balance right, tuning the hyperparameters, uh, weighting the different loss terms. It can be more art than science sometimes, requiring careful experimentation. A bit fiddly, perhaps. It can be, and maybe the most fundamental limitation. A PINN is only as good as the physical model you give it. Garbage in, garbage out, physics edition. Pretty much. If the governing equations you're using are inaccurate, or maybe too simplified, which often happens in industrial settings where you use approximations, then the PNN's ability to leverage that physics is limited. Its performance will inherently be capped by the fidelity of your physical understanding and model. Right. If your physics textbook is wrong, the student won't learn the right things. Yeah. Okay. So complexity, cost, tricky training, independence on accurate physics models. Those are important considerations. Absolutely. So given the pros and cons, how does someone actually decide if PNNs are worth the effort for their specific anomaly detection problem? Is there a way to gauge the fit? Yeah, the guide we looked at proposes a really neat quantitative decision framework. It's basically a set of seven questions to help you think through the key factors. Okay, a checklist. I like checklists. It's more of a guided scoring system. For each question, you give yourself a score from zero to two based on how well PNN seems suited for that aspect of your problem. Right. What sort of questions are we talking about? Okay, so quickly. Question one is about your understanding of the normal system physics. Do you know the governing equations well? High score, if yes. Makes sense. Need the physics knowledge. Question two is about the difficulty of actually encoding and solving that physics within a PNM. Is it super complex PDEs or relatively manageable? High score if it's feasible. Practicality check. Question three asks about the availability of labeled anomaly data. Do you have lots of it or very little? PNNs shine when labeled data is scarce, so you get a high score if you don't have much anomaly data. Counterintuitive, but fits the PNN strengths. Question four is about having enough normal measurement data. PNNs still need some data to anchor them. High score if you have decent normal operations data. Okay. Question five looks at how well your current anomaly detection methods are working. If they're doing great, maybe you don't need PNNs. High score if existing methods are struggling. If it ain't broke. Question six is crucial. How important is it to understand the physical reasons behind an anomaly? If you really need that root cause insight, PNNs get a high score. The Y factor again. And finally, question seven is about resources. Do you have the necessary expertise, people who understand both the physics and ML and the computational tools? High score if yes. The practicalities of actually doing it. Okay, seven questions. You score them zero, one, or two, then what? Then you add up the scores. The guide suggests some rough ranges. 
If you score, say, 12 to 14, it strongly suggests pivoting towards exploring pin ends seriously. High potential. If you're in the middle, maybe 8 to 11, it's worth exploring pin ends, perhaps starting with simpler hybrid approaches or pilot projects. Tentative exploration. And if your score is low, maybe 0 to 7, it suggests that sticking with conventional ML methods might be more practical or effective for your specific situation right now. Stick with what works. But there's a caveat. The guide stresses that a few criteria are really critical, specifically understanding the physics, Q1, the feasibility of implementing it, Q2, and having the resources, Q7. Hmm. If you score zero on any of those three, big red flag. Even if your total score is high, scoring zero on one of those fundamental requirements means you should probably proceed with extreme caution or maybe reconsider if PNNs are viable for you at this time. That's a really useful framework, grounded and practical. Okay, so let's try and wrap this up. What's the final takeaway message on PNNs for industrial anomaly detection? I think the core message is that PNNs represent a really promising uh, evolution in how we can tackle anomaly detection, especially in these systems where physics plays such a dominant role. They directly address some fundamental weaknesses of purely data-driven approaches. Right. The black box issue, the data scarcity, the extrapolation problems, lack of insight. Exactly. By weaving in that fundamental physical knowledge, they offer the potential for more robust, insightful, and data-efficient anomaly detection. They're not magic. They have their hurdles, the complexity, the cost, the need for good models. But the potential payoff is significant. It really seems to be, especially when understanding the why behind an anomaly is just as important as catching it in the first place. The different implementation patterns show there's flexibility too. So for those of you listening who are wrestling with complex physical systems and finding traditional methods maybe aren't quite enough, mm -hmm. it seems like asking, could we encode some physics here? Might be a really valuable question. Definitely worth considering. Which leads to maybe a final thought to leave you with. If embedding fundamental knowledge like physics can enhance AI in industrial monitoring, what other domains, what other kinds of fundamental knowledge could we potentially embed in our models to move beyond just learning from data patterns alone? Mm, that's a big question. Something to ponder. Okay, that's our deep dive for today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me.